Good morning, it's Reverend Mike Capron. And uh, I have a sermon this morning requested by one of my parishioners, a man named Bob. I uh, wanted to know about life with Jesus and life without Jesus. And uh, so I picked this text, Matthew 19, 16 to 22, um, with the person who probably comes as close as you can to becoming a disciple of Jesus without actually doing it, at least not in this scene. Um, I'll read the text for you. Just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied, there is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Which ones, the man inquired. Jesus replied, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother, and love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the young man said. What do I still lack? Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. This ends our reading. And by the way, I've inserted one phrase from Mark's accounting of this story. Um, in our Matthew reading. I don't usually do that, but it worked today. So, um, let's talk about this man, and here's what I propose to do. First, we will look at the things this man got right, and then we will look at what he got wrong. His first, best, most right thing that he did was to seek out Jesus. He had heard of Jesus. He was attracted to Jesus. He understood that Jesus had the answers he was looking for. Here's the second thing he does right. He knew that something was missing in his life. By worldly standards, he had it all. Money, learning, a position of authority, we don't know what kind. But he definitely had people who worked for him. He was also religiously devout, a decent, honest man, no adultery, no stealing, no perjury, took care of his parents, loved his neighbors as himself. We would love to have this guy as our neighbor. From the outside looking in, there is nothing wrong with him, but he knew something was wrong. And there's one more thing that was right about him. He knew something was wrong, something was missing, and so he sought out Jesus. All right, on to part two, the things that are wrong with our so-called rich young ruler. Right from the get-go, he asks the wrong question. Teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? We're going to examine that question carefully. His first word is teacher. Lots of people call Jesus that, but we can notice from this that he does not really understand that he isn't talking to an ordinary rabbi. He doesn't know that he's addressing God's promised Messiah. It's understandable that he doesn't know this in the beginning, but part of his ultimate problem is that he doesn't know it at the end of the conversation either. And now we also notice that he asked for the wrong thing. He asked for eternal life. And that is a selfish thing to ask for. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm glad that Christians have eternal life in Christ. But as many of you have heard me say many times, to seek eternal life for its own sake puts you on treacherous ground. It can lead you to fall into the trap of thinking that how you live your life in this world doesn't matter at all. And you fail to live the decades you have here and now as Jesus' disciples. To quote a cliche, it's more about the journey than the destination. Our journeys as disciples are important. Never forget that. Never settle for a half-hearted faith. And the gift of Christ is to redeem and transform our lives here and now. And yes, I completely look forward to the next life as well, but I deeply treasure the freedom that we find in Christ in this life, a freedom we can't earn. And that's the other thing wrong with this question. He asks what good thing he must do. My friends, you probably know this one. We cannot earn our salvation from what we do, from our works. Paul explains this beautifully in Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. I'm just going to read that. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. 
even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. I love that passage. It starts with love, goes to mercy, then emphasizes grace. And finally, faith is the thing which allows us to realize the grace and the love and take it in. And so this young man who is both eager and proud explains to Jesus that he has perfectly kept the commandments. If I were there, I would have looked at him skeptically, raised an eyebrow and said, really? <laughs> but notice what Jesus does. He just looks at him and loves him. Jesus knows that what he has said is incorrect because Jesus knows all our sins. But he sees his youthful intensity, his wish to be better, and he loves him. No doubt Jesus considered his next words carefully. This is a delicate moment. He does not want to crush this young person's spirit, but he does want to lead him to a deeper, more transformative faith. What could he say that would strike just the right note? Here it is. One thing you lack, just one. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. I'm sure Jesus could see from the man's face that he had hit the target squarely. Everyone has something about themselves that they value something that is precious to them, something we are a little too proud of. For this man, it was his wealth. The text says plainly, he went away sad because he had great wealth. I wish we knew a few more details. Did he get an offended look on his face and kind of stomp off? Did he murmur some apology that he had to go think about it? We don't know. All we know is he walked away. At that moment, he chose life without Jesus instead of life with Jesus. Um, in my congregation this morning, I'm going to invite people to think about what this man might have said about his encounter when he, he talks to his friends later. Um, it's kind of an interesting question. You know, is he, is he putting a bunch of blame on Jesus for being unreasonable? Is he really heart stricken himself? Does he eventually come back and maybe do what Jesus said? Um, we just don't know. The text is spare. It does not tell us. You know, my hunch about his main issue goes something like this. He was selfish. He had a good life and he wanted to top it off by adding a little more. He wanted Jesus as an additive, a dietary supplement that would improve his life just a little. He figured he was doing fine, but you know, maybe a 1% more improvement would be nice. Jesus doesn't go for that, not ever. Jesus has to be our top priority, our number one, our all in all. That doesn't mean that we get rid of all our other priorities, but it means that Jesus has to come first. He's more important than our jobs. Matthew 4, 28 to 22. Jesus saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake. They were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Jesus is more important than our family. In Luke 14, 26 to 27, Jesus said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, he doesn't mean for us to literally hate people, but he means for our allegiance to Christ to be so much in the lead that whatever comes second is way back there, and it almost seems like hate by comparison. 
whatever it is that prevents you from following Jesus is in the way, and you have to get rid of it. And Jesus is more important than our money and our possessions. As he told this young man, if you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, come and follow me. You know, the issue that we have is distinct to each one of us, right? That thing which we can't imagine ever moving to the number two slot. What we don't know is how much better our life will be if we put Jesus in the lead slot and let those other things slide down a notch because suddenly everything will fall into place and make sense. Doesn't mean life will always be easy, but it will make more sense. And we'll have a kind of a pull star to guide us. Anyway, here's your takeaway from this sermon. Jesus is not a condiment. <laughs> Adding a little Jesus to one's current life does nothing. It is still a life without Jesus. But deciding to follow Jesus, no matter what it takes, will change your life. That is life with Jesus. Not only will you have treasure in heaven, but your life here and now will be more exciting, fulfilling, and just overall better. And you get to share Jesus' love with other people through your words and by your deeds and by your life. May it be so, my friends. God bless. Amen.